calling the Waitley Elementary School Committee meeting to order at 4 p.m. On the dot. Um, all right. Can I have a, a motion to approve the minutes of January 5th? So moved. And a second? Uh, second. All in favor, Bob? Yes. Beth? Yes. And Maureen, yes. And handing over to you, Shelley. Hi. Uh, so I emailed you all this afternoon or this morning maybe um, that there's not a monthly formal financial update, but I did send the expense reports and I'm happy to take questions if you have them. Um, Waitley had a quite a bit of warrants since the last meeting just because of how your meeting was spaced out. There was 21 warrants signed and reviewed electronically totaling $81,601.95 um, and more to come for FY22 budget when we get to that agenda item. I have no questions. I do not either. Um, public comment. I did get an email from Donna. There was one public comment submitted in advance from Lisa Moore of Reservoir Road in Sunderland. She would like to have, I would like to have anti-racism curriculum for the students to be mandat mandatory. In addition, the teacher should have training to support the students improve their understanding. And that was it for that statement. I don't see anyone else on, so that is it for public comment. Now we're on to unfinished business. Are we going to have an anti-racism update today? Yep, Amanda Mosea is supposed to join us. Um, maybe she's running a few minutes late, so I, I would suggest we move. I can go into the COVID update if you'd like, and then sure. as soon as she jumps on, we can move it. Sounds good. All right. um, the COVID update, you know, just kind of like what's, what's going on with COVID and going on and so forth. Um, just the overview there right now, um, the two things I have to update us on is that the pool testing. Um, <clears throat> so we we did enroll for the statewide six weeks of pool testing um, under that initiative. However, their rollout has been um, disastrously slow coming out of the state. You know, we did not, we still have not got the, um, we signed up on on time and all that stuff we were supposed to, but they then provided us with a the provider, there's three providers in the state, and um, we have not got the link yet to send out to families to get families to give us consent to in order to do the testing. We expect that today. Um, we have the draft all ready to go, plug in the thing, and then we'll send it out to the principals to send it out. So we're going to do that by school. Um, so it really is not going to start up until um, the week after break. So I don't know if the state's going to make an adjustment because we lost a week of their six weeks. Um, We'll see what's happening there. There's a meeting with the commissioner coming up, I think on Thursday. So I'm sure that question is going to be asked of them um, to find that out. So that's kind of where we are there. Um, any questions on the pool testing? I, I forget what how much detail I've given each school committee now that I've gone a couple times through. Um, so you said that's only going to be a six week program. So yeah, good question. Thank you. Um, the six week. So we get. Six weeks paid for by the state. Then after that, we have to decide if we want to take on that expense. Okay. Um, the expense for Waitley is about $7,000 to do the remaining 11 weeks of the school year. So I really want us to go into it. And I've even said this to the associations, the meaning the teachers, um, just to base everybody. We're going to go through this. You know, we get it for free. We get it at a unique time when our teachers are not vaccinated yet. So it's kind of why not, you know, continue to do as many safety precautions as we can, um, you know, for students and faculty, but obviously older people are, the more susceptible they are to adverse effects of COVID. Um, so um, when we're done, you know, during the final weeks of this thing, I, you know, I plan on, you know, discussing at school committees, like, do we want to invest the money to continue? Um, do we need to have a continue? Do we need to do everybody? You know, do we do certain grades? Do we do rotating grades? You can do whatever you want type of contract, at the, whatever you want, meaning the, 
that the vendor will allow different contracts with the, the state contracts after the, the six week period. So we could say, you know, we want to do one, three, five, one week and K, you know, two, six, four, six, the other week or, you know, whatever, you know, we want to do coming out of that. If we want to reduce that cost, we may say, hey, we thought this was worth the $7,000 moving forward. As teachers get vaccinated, of course, that number will go down because it'll be less tests. Um, it may not be less pools. So we'll have to see how that that kind of that kind of works out, you know, financially. But so that's kind of how we're going to go into it. Um, I didn't think when the, we a lot of districts chose not to do this. I think I said it last time in our last meeting. Um, I didn't see it as something like why wouldn't we give it a try, see what it's like. Um, it's free. It also kind of gets us through a, you know, the the last end of winter. You know, we get through this. Also, we're going to be outdoors more, so we have that kind of safety precaution back in. So we can kind of justify not, in a way, um, continuing it if it doesn't work out for us, or we might find it extremely valuable and we try to find seven thousand dollars somewhere um, to pay for, it or or less, seven thousand or less. Obviously, that's the the max number. That's you know what everybody would be eleven weeks or it, Bob. Is that something like, um, can we, if we have, if he has COVID money, could they use COVID money as that seven, for that $7,000? You could. Um, Waitley, I think, used most of its COVID money. We also have, and Shelly's going to talk about the Essler, Essler 2 grant money, which could be used for that, but we're looking at using that to help with some budget stuff. So, you know, everything's kind of, we're trying to use all monies that we have. So there's nothing really like, oh, we have this pot of money we didn't know else to spend it on because they really have, we're at the beginning of this year, a lot of the COVID money had a lot of restrictions on it. They're starting to loosen those up because there's so many different things that have been affected by COVID, which we'll talk about in our budget. Um, so you'll kind of get a better understanding there, but there may be monies within those lines that could pay for it. But again, I think we have to look at, be honest, what is the value of it at that point? Um, it does go into the following question of what does school look like after the teachers are vaccinated? Um, that's kind of the question that's starting to pop up, meaning that, excuse me, I don't know. Um, another part of my thing, it's, it's actually Carolyn Ness texting me, um, which I'll talk about vaccinations in a minute. Um, so, um, you know, what does it look like? How are things gonna change? We're waiting on what the, you know, the Department of Public Health is gonna say coming out of the state. Um, can we reduce the space between students and desks. We know people are gonna probably be masked through the end of the year um, because they're not certain if even if you are vaccinated, if you can be a carrier. There's no child vaccination. Um, the timeline for that I'm told is late summer at the earliest. So, you know, we're gonna probably be going back to school next year without a, a widespread vaccination of youth. So, you know, it comes to question, I'm looking for guidance from the medical professionals from the state. Um, on how do we proceed moving forward? You know, we've, we've seen the data that I've seen, you know, but I haven't seen every piece of data, of course, um, is that, you know, you know, children under the age of 18 do not have, um, have mild effects from COVID. So um, as a whole, and, and, you know, the fatality rate is, I think, zero or very close there too um, in the state of Massachusetts. So the question is going to be, is this, are we going to treat this disease like we do uh, chicken pox or other kind of things where we continue to, I guess chicken pox might be a bad example, I probably pick a better disease, um, where we, you know, as there's outbreaks, we shut down certain things, but we continue moving forward. We bring back more students in the classroom because that will be an issue. Spacing the way we have it can't be six feet um, to get people back five days a week. So um, those are kind of things that are going to be our next challenge, that, you know, they're good challenges. These are the challenges we want, bringing people back and how do we do it rather than how do we educate when they're away. So. Darius, that pool testing, um, does it, is there a limit to how many individual swabs or whatever go into one pool? Yes, um, I believe it's 10. Depending on the vendor, I think our vendor is 10, so you create your own pools. They don't want you to create large pools because if you have a positive, it's a lot more chasing and tracing down where you have to, you know, obviously keep people out or we're going to keep people out too until we get everybody antigen tested. Um, and remember, we can do the antigen testing on site. And then if the antigen testing doesn't work, they allow you to do single PCR testing of every single person in that pool, um, which you then would send in. So we actually do all the testing right here on site. And that's kind of a new thing that we learned a couple of days ago. 
um, with our particular company. So, um, you know, the pools will probably be by class, or you know, Christy might be able to know even have better plans. You want to comment at all, Christy, on that? Do you have any ideas exactly how you're yeah. going to set it up? Here? I went to a, another webinar today, um, and they reiterated that you just it's more for staffing that we need to be cautious about who goes in the same pool. Um, for instance, I would want to keep the instructional assistant and the teacher in different pools so that if something came back, I wouldn't be knocking them both out while we um, tried to figure out what was going on with that particular pool. So um, we're going to do it by class. We are going to, once we find out who's going to participate, I'm going to go class to class and do the pools by seating arrangement so that when we test a, a group of 10, it'll be kids who all sit next to each other so that it'll help us narrow things down a little bit more. and, and sort of uh, lessen the impact on the, the class as a whole rather than just doing it randomly across mm -hmm. the class. Although, you know, obviously the kids don't stay in that formation all day. They, you know, they go outside and they play. Um, but we're just looking for little ways to minimize the impact that this has. So, um, you know, the, the biggest thing I hadn't thought of, and I think Darius, you were the one that brought it up, was, was being careful about what staff members you know, if I if I throw myself in with um, you know a class and they get positive, then I'm I'm going to take some time off. Um, so I, I need to be careful about how we do that. Make sure that there's enough. One would easily say when you walk into Whaley, one would say, "Well, you, Mary, the nurse, and and Lola should all be in the same pool because you're kind of all together." But if you guys tested positive. We'd Mary be, and I cannot be out on the same day. <laughs> right. And so you know, so they say that, like, don't do your whole custodial staff. Don't do your the larger schools. Don't do your whole nursing staff. Don't do your whole administration as a pool. Divide them into other pools. Um, and, I mean, the pools should be reflective of what we see in our community, which means, I'm just kind of saying, it, it should be a lot. It should be, I'm expecting, knock on wood, 99.9% um, of these are going to come back negative because that's what we're seeing. We're not seeing symptomatic kids in the building. We're not hearing about cases. And we have pretty good contact tracing in our community. So again, one would say, is this is this overkill? Yeah, but we have it for free, so let's try it. And it make people, you know, make people feel safer. And can you tell me um, the cost? Is it per pool or per number of samples in that pool for the cost of this? Um, once we would have to pay? It's five dollars per sample, thirty dollars per pool. So we did get the least expensive nonprofit um, organization, which I was happy with, you know, because we know we're not getting the, the group that's taking us is donating all extra monies that they've earned to charity afterwards. So it's it makes me feel better about the fact of that we're not overpaying for. And what's interesting is the other two companies that are also in Massachusetts are not, and they actually cost more. And so um, I'm happy that we got the group that we got based on those parameters. We'll see how they're customer services and so on and so forth. But um, so yeah, so you know we'll come up with the numbers on that when we get rolling about what's gonna be like I said, that was the envelope cost that Shelly put together. Um, you know, you could you take your basic number of tests, number of weeks, number of, you know, so on and forth so forth and gives you a basic number. So it's kind of a it's a round up, that's for sure. Okay. Um and have we done any antigen testing yet in Waitley? Sounds like we haven't. Or we so, you know, we have we have across the district, and um, we've had we even had a positive in the district, which enabled us to uh, remove someone with before it had spread. We haven't had any school spread yet. Knock on wood. A piece of wood back here. Um, they do knock on. Um, you know, we haven't had school spread, and um, you know, again, it's maybe was a. And we have done other antigen tests with a lot of negatives as well. So where kids have been sick at schools and, and use it. So it's been effective. And um, you had started to say something about the staff vaccinations. Is that still on track? Yeah, so, the state um, was a little behind. Right now they're doing 75 plus, as people kind of know. They then are moving to 65 plus. That includes staffing. So we're helping by um, letting our 65 plus staff know about opportunities there. And then when it's at the next stage, the next step after that is teachers. And so, um, you know, they are going to be bringing um, into Deerfield. They're going to use the Channing Beat 
but now Treehouse Brewery, let's give them credit because they opened up their space to um, to be you know a nice big building. We we had talked about Frontier, and I'm happy that um, Treehouse Brewing has stepped up and allowed them to use their space before they renovate um, because it's a big space. It's not going to interrupt us, but it's also very close for all our schools if they have to swing over during the day. Um, as um, I don't know exactly how they're doing the signups of it, but they're going to start calling people um, as well when there's openings. Um, as well as an open sign up that comes out, they'll send us the newsletter like they did for 75 plus. And I'll get that out to staff. <clears throat> um, can I ask you a different, um, the live streaming link, where is that? I have somebody texting me. They said they they didn't. Um, it's they on it's the public announcement. Um, if, if they look up, if they look up, if they go to YouTube and they type in Waitley Elementary School Committee, it's I'm if watching it live the, right now. The district homepage has the the listing for our school committee meeting. It's the top of the, the list of events. And if you just click on it, it brings you to um, the, the link. Even easier. Thank you, Chris. Okay. We have seven people watching for those bring our readings. Some now taps on, we'll be up to eight. Ratings are important. We, um, should we go on to the budget proposal review? Yep. That's the meat of the order today. Okay. Darius, do you want to share your screen as usual? I will. Thank you. Um, so I did email school committee the link to this document. Um, the first section just gives you a reminder of what FY21 budget was. And then, oh, here's Amanda. I just saw her pop on. Do we want to switch back, Maureen, so she doesn't have to sit through? Sure. Up to yeah, you, yeah. but okay. That sounds like a plan. Okay. Yeah, let me get out of here. Hi, Amanda. Welcome. Hello. <laughs> so, what have you got for us? I have a lot of updates. Okay. So, <laughs> please just bear with me and then I'll I'll read them off and I guess then there will be space for any questions um at the end. Um okay, so for um Black History Month, um there is a resource sent out to all the schools. Um, and the most responses regarding that document have been from the elementary teachers who were really excited to implement this work in their classrooms. Um, at, there was a district read and watch of Amanda Gorman's inaugural poem. Um, and using the last couple of lines of that poem as a focus for the second semester's work. Uh, the school culture committee, there have been peer leadership groups, or the peer leadership group, excuse me, has led two different discussion groups with about 30 participants each time. And the feedback from the participants has been very positive. Um, the theme for this month's discussion is um, privilege and intersectionality. And then there's also going to be an unveiling of the new logo um, at the end of February. Um, there's planning a series of articles in the recorder about um, the logo and expanding to other actions that are being taken with a focus on thinking about student voices, and um, there's a desire to include the elementary schools in that series. So I'm not a part of the school culture committee, but that is work that's going on kind of behind the scenes. Um, from the elementary professional development side of things, I'm working with the elementary schools along with uh, Romina Pacheco and Sapphire DeYoung 
who were serving as kind of anti-racist education consultants this term, um, were focusing in the elementary schools on revamping the curricula to be more culturally responsive. So that means more representative, more inclusive, more social justice and action oriented. Um, and we're using some tools that we that are that were developed by principals, teachers, st and students in conjunction with uh, New York University. And I have kind of adapted those tools so that we can really break them down into kind of bite-sized pieces and work on reevaluating curricula. Um, so working in small groups, teachers, uh, IAs, physical education teachers, school psychiatrists, everybody is going to be kind of assessing either their curriculum or the assessment tools that they use, all of these different areas to acknowledge areas potential for bias, for example, and replacing um, as necessary and incorporating new materials as needed. Um, there will be, I think there will be four or five, the end of the year is not quite fleshed out, but four or five sessions really dedicated to doing this in, in those small groups. So for example, all of the third grade groups are gonna be working together. All the fourth grade teachers are gonna be working together. Um, Let's see. For the high school professional development, they've taken a bit of hiatus, but they start up again on March 3rd. Um, everyone is reading Is Everyone Really Equal? Um, by Robin D'Angelo and Oslam Sensoy. And then there are going to be workshops that are coming from uh, UMass educators starting in. March, I believe March 10th. And the first of that series will be Radical Empathy, or it is with, excuse me, with Radical Empathy Consulting from UMass. Um, and then for curriculum from the high school, they're offering African American Studies as an elective next year. And the peer leadership group will be, I will kind of transition to a class called media activism and social change. Um, and they're hoping in that second class to incorporate visits to the elementary schools as part of that, that programming. Um, and then po from policy and procedures committee, bear with me, this is the last one. <laughs> Um, they got the results from the survey, um, which was all about, you know, how, what policies and procedures are there regarding dealing with microaggressions and incidents of racism. And there is a very clear need for more professional development on firstly identifying microaggressions, but also more just development of procedures and people's awareness of procedures um, around what to do if and when an incident occurs. Um, because for example, one of the questions was, do you feel that there is consistent procedures amongst staff regarding racial incidents? And almost half of the respondents said that they were unsure if there were consistent policies. Uh, which is a strong indicator that there are not. And then I think about three quarters of the responses were either, no, there are not consistent po policies, I'm unsure, or um, there are somewhat clear policies. And to me, a somewhat clear policy is not a clear policy. Um, and the uh, school culture subcommittee has discussed how these incidences, you know, microaggressions, for example, can inform changes um, to the curriculum 
it sounds like there was an incident with the Confederate flag at Frontier. Um, the short-term solution to issues like this is to respond kind of specifically to the incident, but the longer term solution to incidents like this is to incorporate history of what the Confederate flag means and why it was created and what it stands for. And this is why we're not tolerating it. And this is why it is a racist symbol. And this is why it is incomplete to say this is a matter of Southern pride in Western Massachusetts. Um, so there's a lot of moving parts and there's definitely still work to be done. So that was a lot. <laughs> um, I can answer any questions that anyone has. Those workshops you were talking about, I think with UMass, are, mm -hmm. is that with faculty or students or both? That's with faculty. That's with, um, that's going to be professional development for the faculty. Okay. Yeah, not the students. And in our elementary school, um, is have the students started doing anything yet? I mean, they do things throughout the year, but I didn't know if this particular program has started with the students yet because it was going to be starting, you mm -hmm. know, after the holidays. We've not done explicit work with the students. We're more working on the faculty and staff and kind of the structures behind the classroom. And then that will be with this term being thinking about curriculum and then that in turn influencing what's going on with the students and what's going on in the classroom. Um, but the professional development, this term is really thinking about supporting teachers as they're thinking about how they can change their curriculum and how they can have these conversations with students and families, if that answers your question. So it's indirectly related to the students. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's such important work and, and sensitive. We want to make sure that the um, teachers feel like they've got the professional development to approach it um, in the right way. Mm -hmm. One of the things that's been really great um, is the culturally responsive um, curriculum scorecard that you referred to. It takes away the, like, it's my opinion that this is culturally responsive and, and there are actual questions to answer when you're looking at um, curriculum resources, whether or not we're sort of on the right track or not. And so having everyone have this document that we're working off of is, is helpful and will create some consistency throughout the school as teachers begin to look at their own work and the resources they have in their own classrooms. So I think that's an, an excellent place for us to start. Okay, great. Does anyone else have any questions? Okay, Keep thank you. Work, Amanda. Yeah, definitely. Uh, thank, thank you, you Amanda. So all right, thank, thank you, you all. Have a good evening. You Amanda, do you want to stick around and hear about the budget? <laughs> um, maybe next time. <laughs> Take care. Thank all you. Right. Bye, Amanda. No offense, Shelly. You always make the budget sound very engaging and exciting. <laughs> It's fine. Nobody ever likes to talk about money. I get it. <laughs> um, Darius, can you pull that back up for us or should I share? You good? I can. I, and I apologize. I had to step away there briefly for a second. I had a, a call out that was kind of an emergency. All right. Um, all right. Share screen. Okay, so again, just a reminder of what the FY21 budget was and what the percent increases look like mm -hmm. on this year's budget. Um, so we had the first draft. Oh, good. 
uh, that was at 5.68%. The most significant increase here was due to early childhood wage addition because the program has not been bringing in enough revenue this year to support the wages that are normally paid from that fund. Um, went back to draft two uh, as we gain more information. If you remember in January, we had said we were in the early stages of processing the budget um, and that there might be some changes coming down the pike. Um, one of the things that did come up is that we have a retirement, a teacher retirement payout that'll be done uh, in FY22 at Waitley Elementary. And then there was $5,000 added for a couple of different miscellaneous accounts that added up to 5,000. So I wanted to mention that here um, because a $20,000 increase on the budget obviously does have uh, impact on the number. It's you know about a 1% increase. Um, so right now we're looking at a 6.6% increase given the current information. Um, we know that that's higher than we would typically like to present to town. Um, so Darius and uh, Chrissy and I had some conversations um, about how we can make those reductions. And so next we're gonna talk about recommendations um, on how to move forward and bring the general fund budget down slightly. Um, so the first piece that I want to talk about is uh, school lunch. Um, you all know as school committee members, we have been paying school lunch wages directly from the general fund for some time. This has allowed the balance in that revolving account to build up. Um, we've had conversations last year, especially about whether or not we should move um, those expenses back to the revolving fund to free up general fund money. Uh, we hadn't done that in the past. This year, we did not do that either. Um, but I think moving forward, one of the easiest ways for us to reduce the local fund budget is to move the school lunch wages over to the revolving account. Currently, even though we're really just covering um, food costs and supply costs right now because lunch is free for all students, so we're not making a lot of money this year, but we did have a starting balance of 48,000 and we're up to about 56,000 when Jeff sent me the report today, 56, 57,000. So, you know, even if it's only building a little bit month to month, by the end of the year, I think we're probably gonna be maybe at the $62,000 mark, 63. Um, and it's just a lot of money to carry in a revolving fund when school lunch is really not intended to make money. Um, so. I think we're at a point where we could shift wages back uh, and doing that would directly impact the general fund. There's about $30,000 of cafeteria staff wages currently being paid from general fund that my recommendation is to move it over to the revolving account. Even with this change, I do think that there will be reserves going into FY23 and we can take a look at what that number looks like. Um, obviously, we hope that food service can return to some normalcy next year and start to have more significant net income. Uh, but the hope would be that the revolving account for school lunch could carry, if not the full 30000 but some portion of that moving forward so that we're not moving those funds back to the general fund long term. Uh, this is what all how all of our other schools are set up right now in the district. Um, Waitley's the only one that currently has consistently been paid from the general fund. And I understand that was a need at some point, but it looks like it's time to shift that a little bit. Uh, so I would love your support to do that. But we're going and then, right? we're going back. We are going backwards from what we want to do in the future, correct? We uh, want, I'm not we sure I'm following you. On, we do want to put them on the uh, regular account, not the revolving account in the future, right? Well, so what I, I'm I'm not sure. I, I think it depends on what the program can do as we start to rebuild from COVID. So we've seen a significant revenue loss. Um, but if next year school lunch can return to any sort of normalcy, I think we could talk about keeping salaries on the revolving fund. If we consistently are looking at having a positive balance of about $50,000 every year, it makes sense to pay wages from that. You know, if that number starts dwindling down, then we may have to have the conversation about moving it back to the general fund. Does that answer your question, Bob? Yep. My only question is the, the balance there. Do we have to use it for food services or can't we just put it in the rate? Okay. That's what I thought. No. I think I asked. 
<laughs> no, I mean, all it's all reported through the state, through the food service program. They audit it that way. The expenses yeah. have to be spent on school lunch. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's fine. Shelly, um, yeah. how, how is that account increasing since nobody's paying for lunch? No family, like students aren't paying. So we do get some um, federal and state reimbursements because every student right now qualifies under the free and reduced lunch program. So we are getting for every meal that's served, whether it's breakfast or lunch, um, I think it's $2 and change. It's, I know it's under $3 for breakfast and it's slightly over $3 for lunch for every meal served. And that's for pickups and in-service um, food, I mean, in-school food that we're offering. Um, so we are getting some reimbursement and it is um, mm. just barely month to month covering the expenses, but a little bit's being added in there each month to help bring that balance up. So that continued because I remember they you said that that was to the end of the year, end of December, and that must have. Yep, the okay. USDA extended it through June thirtieth as of right now, and we don't know if it will continue beyond then. Okay, so um, in the last meeting we had talked about some capital needs for the cafeteria. Um, has that have those needs been determined, and will this? paying the wages from that take away from that? Um, let me look at the capital list. So that's the new oven that we put in for Wheatley. Um, this is referring to Shelly. Yep. So, um, so we, we, we requested out of the capital fund straight from the town. So this money is not being, being applied there, it's being applied toward the- Okay, um, as the long as the department. town approves. The capital needs. Okay. I looked at. I saw a thing that they sent out today that looks like it's on. The, it's on the list. So we'll okay. see. You know, they're they're having discussions regarding the three, the three things we put forward. <clears throat> okay. Okay. So the next um, point I want to discuss is early childhood. Um, Darius, if you don't mind scrolling down. Um, so. You know, we've talked about this, but just to reiterate why we're facing this challenge with early childhood, our class sizes are reduced this year. Um, most of the kids, correct me if I'm wrong, Chrissy, but I believe most kids are coming for just two days, um, whereas in a typical year, maybe they came for three, four, or five days. So our revenue is down significantly. Um, Waitley Early Childhood Program usually brings in about 120000 in revenue. Uh, with only about 100,000 in expenses. So usually we have 20,000 every year going to the good um, to help us with future unforeseen needs that might come up in the early childhood program. But this year we'll be lucky if we see about 20,000 in revenue. So all of our surplus has been used. Um, we're looking at having a very small rollover to next year, less than 20,000 is what I'm predicting right now. Um, and we don't know what school looks like in the fall. We're not sure if we're going to be able to increase capacity in the classrooms. We don't know what social distancing guidelines are going to be from the state. Um, so we're sort of setting up the budget in a way that we want to be able to cover these wages uh, responsibly just in case the revenue is not there in early childhood. So doing that, moving them from early childhood revolving fund over to the general fund, that was a $60,000 increase in wages. Um, so what we're recommending here is that we look at moving um, $30,000 of that $60,000 onto another funding source. Um, the idea there is that we would be, you know, relatively conservative in protecting ourselves, making sure that we can cover at least half of that expense with revolving funds. I mean, not revolving funds, with um, general funds. And then the er other $30,000 perhaps um, from early childhood if revenues can be increased. Um, we could consider using additional school choice funds. Uh, we could use, um, there is a new CARES Act grant that just came out, it's called ESSER II. Um, I'm still learning about this grant and how much Wheatley's going to be eligible for and what we can use it on, but from what I'm gathering, there are a lot of, um, a lot more flexibility with this funding than with some of the other CARES Act funding that has come out, and we should be able to use it to pay for teacher or IA wages. Um, and then the other option here is to request uh, a town special warrant article to cover that additional cost for us because it is COVID related. Um, doing that would mean that we're not inflating the budget. 
you know, because the idea is that at some point, the revolving fund, the early childhood program is going to be able to build itself back up to cover these wages again. We're just seeing a lull, you know, with, with COVID this year, and it's going to take us a couple years to get back to where we were. We do anticipate we are going to get back to some normalcy, but right now, um, looks like we're looking at at least probably two years. So rather than inflate the budget so significantly, the town may consider covering it whether it's um, free cash or you know another funding source that they have or um, raising it if they need to, um, but that might be something that they could consider. Uh, right now, I, I don't think that that's necessary, and I also don't think that using school of choice funds is necessary. I think we could, since we're not approving a budget today, I think we could sit on this for another month, um, wait and see what else we find out about this ESSER two grant and then come forward with the decision, hopefully fingers crossed to use that money. Um, I did give you, I think a chart at the bottom, Jarius, if you scroll down a little bit more, please stop crying puppy. Um, sorry. Uh, so what we would be looking at here, oh, I have a typo there. That shouldn't say, um, <laughs> pay cafeteria wages with school lunch funds. It should say pay cafeteria wages with, um, oh, just say school lunch. I thought it said school choice. Sorry, I'm distracted by the dog right now. <laughs> so if we pull that 30,000 in cafeteria wages off and then we agree to look for another funding source for the 30,000 in early childhood wages, we're looking at a reduction of 60,000, uh, which brings us down to a 3.31% increase. Um, and then I did want to show you what school choice would look like if we did have to use school choice funds to cover that 30000 for early childhood, even though I don't think we're going to need to. Um, right now, I'm predicting at the end of next year, uh, we'll have about 150000 just shy of in the school choice account. Obviously, if we take 30000 off of that, we're looking at about 120000 um, I still think it's doable for Waitley to do this. You know, school choice funds do supplement the budget. It's It's been practiced for years. You can see our expenses are there. Um, but it's not best practice to continue to overspend the revenue that you're bringing in. And right now, it's clear to see the revenue that's coming in at 180 and our expenses are 325. You know, we're overspending, which means we're eating some of our surplus year to year. So, you know, it wouldn't be recommended to necessarily go that route and add more to it. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's not like we're depleting all of our funds. We, we look to carry at least one year's um, revenue over. So we'd really be shooting for that goal of having a $180,000 balance at the end of the year. Um, but it is an option. And I, I did just want to let you know what school choice would look like there. So I know I gave you a lot of information. So let me know what questions you have. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Probably for Chrissy. Chrissy, are are the are the young kids in school one day, two days a week? Are they doing remote? And are we are teachers helping other places if they're not needed? I just I, I guess there's a bunch of questions there. Are you talking about the preschool? I'm, about pre kids? I'm talking about preschool. So um, there are preschool kids here. Um, actually five days a week oh. on, on Wednesday it's um, staff children are here so that I can have those staff members doing um, their other their other job um, it's two days a week but the reason why we had to we had to bring the numbers way down because we had 20 students originally enrolled for our pre-k program um, and it does require the three adults because a they're outside most of the time even on our snowiest, coldest days, those kids are staying outside for a good chunk of the day. Um, but also, our little ones aren't so great at knowing what a six-foot distance looks like, um, keeping masks on. So it requires a whole lot more supervision um, than you would expect. And it's still we have, you know, an average of you know eight to ten kids here on any given day, and and it is requiring um, three staff members to to manage that because it's it's just completely different than anything we've ever experienced. <laughs> Did we have to hire a new person to be the third person or are we no. using, okay, that's what I, you know, I figure we're using other people. Yeah, I'm grateful that we're able to have any kind of preschool program. We don't want to 
to let that go. It's valuable in a, in a million different reasons, but um, it's great to, to see them here. The little kids handle it really well. Thanks for answering my question. Did we ever determine if um, the families that are, you know, two days, are they paying still this year? I know Beth had asked that the last time. They, they do pay, but it's prorated based on the number of days that they're here. Right. And I can't remember if it was this meeting or another meeting. Somebody asked me about when we're, when we go remote, are they paying? Oh, Maybe Beth had asked me that. Um, I, I did ask Amy, I think it's a very nominal amount, like, you know, very, very little. Um, so they are still paying something, but it's significantly reduced. Um, Shelly, just so I'm understanding, um, for the 30,000 that we're looking to cover, um, the best scenario is to cover it with the new CARES Act grant. Um, do you have any idea of how much we'll be getting through that and when that's coming? So the application and the information is just coming out from the state. I'm sorry. He's really being a pain. Um, and so I, I think Waitley is going to probably be getting somewhere around 80,000, but there is some language written into the law around it that the town can actually access that if their local required contribution is going up which for Waitley Elementary, it is going up. So Darius and I are going to have a conversation with Brian um, from Town Hall about whether or not the town is gonna access those funds. And if they do, our number obviously goes down for what's available for us, but I will still have um, at least 30,000 available. Um, and the application, so you can actually apply for it now and use it for FY21, or you can wait and do an application deadline of July 30th, and the funds can be used in 22 and in 23. It actually doesn't expire until September of 23, which is the 24 school year. So they're giving us several years to use the money, which is great because you can just continue to roll it over. So if we don't spend it all next year, it's not a use it or lose it for several more years. So this could actually help us for the FY23 school year as well. So it's really great the way that they've set it up. That's great. And there's certain stipulations as to what you can use the money on. Yeah, it's it's a lot more loose right now than it was. So this is called ESSER 2. There was an ESSER 1, and that was a little bit tighter, but they've added in this line that basically says you can use it for anything that you would potentially have to cut from your budget. So if we had to say, we can't afford this, um, and we're going to have to cut staffing to meet budget, you can definitely use these funds to do that. So that's sort of the way that we would be looking to use it with covering early childhood wages. Great, thank you. Yeah, you're and we don't think we'll need that for, we don't anticipate any other need for that chunk. I don't think for this year we do. Um, we do, we ha still have some ESSER 1 funds available for this year and the state also just announced another, it's a state funded, not federal funded, which I believe is the first that the school is receiving from the actual state is it's called the Coronavirus Prevention Fund. Um, and that has a little bit more strict guidelines on it and it's a much smaller amount. I think Waitley's portion is like 10 or 12,000. Um, but it's a perfect use of money for PPE, cleaning supplies, um, if anything else technology related comes up. Um, so I feel pretty good about at least getting us to June 30th with any unforeseen expenses. I also think Chrissy's been really conservative. If you look at the expense reports, there's quite a few lines that still have significant funds available this year. Um, so I do think we're actually going to have some savings at some point that we can put into school choice like we did last year. For example, we're not using the substitute line very frequently. Um, you know, I think Chrissy's been covering that with existing staff, including herself. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really only me, and I haven't drafted my bill yet for what that's going to cost. So I'll get back to you on that. So I think we're in good shape right now. Um, and even, like I said, if we have to use part of that money with the new grant to pay this 30000 I still think we're going to have a chunk of funds left for something that comes up that's unforeseen. And um, 
I saw somewhere there's like a bunch of HVAC maintenance and like a couple visits a year and um, filter replacements and UVC lighting and all that. Is that already factored in to the budget? Yeah, so a lot of that this year were it was additional expenses because we did an assessment of the HVAC system and any um, repairs that were needed and we bought new filters because the MERV 8s that we had were not as high quality as MERV 13s. Um, so most of that was actually paid from the municipal COVID funding that we received from the town. Um, moving forward, you know, Bill is going to probably have to make some adjustments to his purchasing so that we make sure that facilities has everything that they need. Um, and we are going to have it was annually, I believe, Darius, but now we're looking at semi-annually for the HVAC check. So, you know, there could be a minor increase right there. But again, looking historically and including this year at what Wheatley's spending on building repairs for um, facilities and supplies, we're under budgets, you know, pretty, pretty, pretty consistently year to year. So I think we'll be okay. And um, if we do get... Like with this draft two of the budget, a 3.31% increase. I know the town likes to see the 2.5%. Are we still hoping to get to that point? Or we're, we still have un unknowns? That's a really One good thing question. I'd like to point out is that last year we had to go back in and readjust to be level funded from, from the previous year. So you know, we didn't have an increase last year and that was, you know, we had to kind of stretch things a little bit. So I, it's gonna be really difficult, at least in in my opinion, to get down below 2.5. I'm pretty happy and ready to do cartwheels when I see that 3% number. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, and Marine, you asked the, that's the, not the million dollar question, that's the budget question. It's like, what is the number that we feel comfortable bringing forward to the town to have a discussion with? Um, this is what it costs to run what we currently have. You know, the bottom statement of their request said, also add anything that you need in order to attract more school choice students. Well, it's not going to be guy cutting staff. Um, so, you know, this is kind of getting us through this year. And, and Waitley's in a, probably of, you just have to say it out loud, of the five budgets right now, Waitley's is in much better shape than the other towns in the sense of how COVID has affected um, the budgets with those revolving accounts. You guys were in, were in better shape prior. And, you know, that assessment's not, is nowhere near what the other towns are looking at in the sense of, uh, um, you know, what they're going to be looking at. Also, your assessment from Frontier is going to be in, in better shape as well. Um, it hasn't been set by Frontier yet, but it just statistically looking at the numbers coming out from the state, you're going to be in better shape from Frontier as well. So being a little bit higher, and Chrissy is right, that we did a zero increase and we based that all on savings. And now we got to roll that into the next year. Um, you know, getting in below two and a half, Getting below two and a half is is going to be tight. You know, um, you're going to have to we we'll have to do reductions or eat up or hurt ourselves by eating so much school choice that next year we're going to have a problem and not have the flexibility to move things around. Or we don't know what the fall brings, and we need to have some some wiggle room in our budget to deal with the fall. So my suggestion is that we we bring this we can bring this forward. We do have a meeting. We usually sit down with finance and and select board and say this is what we're doing take a look at what we got and they ask us a bunch of questions and they can let us know if they want us to take it back and cut it further. But again, it's really your call. This is, this is where you guys make the money. Um, so you know, but it, is, it is, this is the, the kind of the bottom line of the school committee is you decide the funding for what the town should do to support the school. So if you want to see that number lower, we can come back and lower and show you what that, what causes that to be lower. Um, I, I just didn't. I just didn't know if we were like with draft one. We had a starting point, and this was draft two. We were bringing it down. I didn't know if we were still, you know, draft three would be a little more before we would go to the town. So it sounds like this is the budget that we pretty much that we're hoping to go to the town with. I mean, this is a moving target still, and I think the town right. understands that while they're going through starting their budget process as well. And I know um, 
the town administrator wants to, you know, be thinking globally about all of their expenses, but I think they're also understanding that the school needs more time. So one of the things that I do see potential happening is that early childhood enrollment grows significantly because the restrictions from the state are re reduced. And we know in another, you know, four, six weeks, what our enrollment projections and what our revenue projections look like. And if those are significantly higher, you know, perhaps we're moving another portion, maybe it's 10,000 of the remaining 30,000 onto early childhood. So, you know, I, I think nothing is set in stone yet, but I think as far as um, Darius and Chrissy and I feel that if that, if there is no other opportunity to move funds around, 3.31 feels like a good budget for us before we have to talk about programmatic or personnel changes, which we really don't want to get into. Okay. Uh, I got a question. Uh, Shelly, uh, did you say the end balance next year is 117,000 on school choice? That's what I'm predicting it would be if we paid the early childhood wages, the additional thirty thousand out of there, which which gives us the three point three one percent increase on the budget, correct? Right, but I'm saying if we can use those grant funds first and leave school choice, that's what we should do. So I just the, wanted you to see what the number would look like. But is the one hundred seventeen thousand with paying the with paying or without paying? With. Okay, so if we do, if we if we don't use it, then that'll go back into school choice. Correct. Okay. But if it goes back into school choice, can we take can we take some of that money to get it down with still having a cushion, bring it down to two and a half? I'm just, you know, I'm hey, three point three one with what's going on, I think is great. But if we can if there's a if we got the grant, then we can if we could take the, some of the school choice money that we're going to do on wages and put it in other parts and bring it down to two and a half percent or thereabouts, it may make us look a little bit better. Yes, Darius, just, are you going to say something? I wasn't sure. Right. It's the balancing of the revolving accounts with that money versus the budget. Now, if you use school choice to pay it on the budget, you're just paying that much next year and then you, once you supplement using school choice into your general budget. So you know, the revolving accounts, it makes sense to, but when you start going to the, the general budget, if you use school choice, if you use $10,000 this year, well, next year you have $10,000 plus any addition that's already on school choice. So you well, never we want to really use, you want to use school choices for one and done items if you can. You know, we have been applying it to budgets in small amounts over time, but it's, it's going to be there every year. Kind of like, you know, obviously we're doing a frontier. You know, we use E&D every year. Well, now it's naturally inflated the budget um, moving forward. So you got to be careful. You know, you pay this year, you use it this year, you're going to use it next year plus, and then you won't have anything left for a cushion. So How about the fifteen thousand dollars for for a retirement? We can use it. We can use it out of school choice instead of putting it in the budget. I mean, I'm, that's just another chunk taken off. That it's a one time, like Darius said, it's a one time thing. So. We ought, you know, maybe we ought to look at that if we get the eighty thousand or whatever on that grant, the lesser two grand or whatever. You know, that would bring it down. Well, it'd probably bring it down to work because it's if one percent is seventeen thousand. Is that what I was saying? One percent seventeen thousand. So we're at fifteen thousand. So that will get us closer to two and a half. I'm, you know, I'm just, I'm just throwing things out there. I mean. I'm good at three and three point three one, but if we can, if if and when we get things, then I, you know, I would like to see us get down a little bit and pay that retirement out of school choice. But that's that's just me. So, so Shelley, if we if we do what Bob's suggesting there, what are your thoughts on? So if we take um, if we use Essler money instead of school choice. But we use school portion of school choice. Now it's half the amount to pay for that retirement. That's going to bring us almost. That'll bring us to three, five, and change. So five, six, or seven, which I think I'm hearing possibly reading into Maureen and Bob on that. That the, those committees they would be more comfortable with getting it under three. 
Right. Yeah, I just made um, made that quick change to our live actual budget document. And if we take that 15,000 off, that is for the retirement payout, we drop to 2.47. And it would leave school choice, um, assuming there's no other changes, around 130,000 versus the 117. I, I think it's I think it sounds better. I think it works well, better. Now, or, I mean, yeah, I do too. Don't go under two point five. <laughs> Doesn't that make us we gave zero last year? Zero, and they didn't need it. <laughs> um, the other thing I was thinking about is because when I was looking at the en enrollment list, we're down quite a bit, if I remember correctly. Um, and I have also, it looks like we have a lot of openings for school choice, but I know there's a delay on getting that money. Um, and I, I have heard that there was some, a good bit of interest locally and, in, um, families from some other towns coming to Waitley, um, that, that that won't help us probably next year. It would take a couple years, right, to get that money. But um wondering the max number of kids per grade. It used to be around 21, maybe 22. What are we looking at now, Chrissy, for what we'd like to see in a class when things get back to quote unquote normal? So normal, no distancing issues. Um, 18 to 20 for kindergarten, first, second grade, and then um, 20 for third, fourth, fifth, sixth. Which is a good number if, if a teacher has an aid. It, it's a right. beautiful number. Yep. Yep. Um, and it all depends on I, you know, what type of kids we have in each class too. Yeah, well, I mean, the nice thing about our size now is that we have the ability to give individual attention wherever it is needed, um, which is which is great. Um, you know, I, I talked to Darius about this, and it's actually going to be something that the admin team is going to talk about, um, trying to project out what it's going to look like in the fall to determine how many school choice spots we actually have is, is tricky territory to be in right now. Um, you know, a lot of it has to do with what we're required to keep for spacing with six feet distance. I can fit 14 students in a classroom and that's what the teachers have gotten rid of their own furniture. There's no extra bookcases. There's nothing. It's just student desks, maybe a small table in the corner for the, the teacher to work off of, but uh, we can't really stretch it any further than uh, 14. So. So I assume at this point, we're not doing anything to attract school of choice students. Well, I, it's a discussion that Mary and I have every year at this time about, you know, where do we want to advertise? Um, at this moment, before we've actually done anything, um, we have 12 school choice applications for next year. And we have two sixth graders who are school choice. So we'll be losing two. Um, which is a, a good position to be in, you know, to be able to, to have that larger number coming in. But ag again, I don't, I, I wish I had a crystal ball to know what was going to happen. You say we're losing two for sixth grade next year? Yeah, when the, when the sixth grade graduates. Oh yeah. Yeah. They'll we're be losing two. We'll lose two school choice kids. Okay. Do we, do we have, I don't see a list in the packet. Usually we get a, um, the sheet that shows, you know, pre, pre kindergarten, right down to sixth grade. It um, was that, there. Was it there? Yeah, it was, um, a spreadsheet. Oh, was it one of the green, uh, green ones there? Okay. I'm looking. Oh, geez. Last page. Last page. Can you, Kirsty, can you tell us how many school choice kids we have right now? Is it, am I looking at 32? Yep. Okay. So we're only going to lose two. So hopefully we'll have 30 coming back. Is that what the projection is right now without adding? That is right now without knowing um, yet what will be coming in just from kindergarten. 
Okay. So, so the so the thirty, the thirty that we have that are hopefully coming back is part of your your hundred and thirty thousand dollars balance, Shelley, for next year. I mean, that's what we're going off. We're not talking about anybody new, the twelve applicants or anything like that. Correct. Okay. I'm just. I'm just asking. No, that's a good, it's a good question. Um, so what the state does is they, right now, um, our numbers are based on, our, our payments are based on what they were last June. Yeah. But then they take your October 1 of the new year enrollment and they adjust your numbers. So if your numbers go up or down from June 30th, they make an adjustment. But then for the following year, they do the same thing. So June 30th comes, they set our you know, numbers and things like that. So if you look at the cherry sheets right now that the state puts out that it tells you what your choice should be, your and last year's final cherry sheet matches this year's preliminary. So the June 30th is always the number that we go off of. But you're absolutely right in the sense that the school is trending in the correct direction. So it's kind of a quiet, like you have, you know, you have an allowance that's coming possibly if we have, if we take, you know, five to 10 more schools, because you're, even though we have the applicants, they may not all come. They may change their mind between now and then. But if everything opens up and we allow 10 more, well, we're going to be in a better financial situation right there. That's going to help us out. $50,000. You can do the math real easily. Not even talking about spend increments that go with it. So you can kind of know that in the, in the background, but you, you should never plan on it because we could also have two leave. You could have, you know, let's say there's a family of two, they decide to just move. It, it's not about leaving about negativity or anything. And you just don't know. So, um, but you, you are correct to say like, it's good to see the numbers are up. It's a positive thing. There's a positive climate in the community regarding Waitley and some neighboring towns have seen that. I mean, I remember, you know, Frontier is one of the few di districts that have been open as long as we have. And um, all the other positive stuff we're doing, it's not just about being open, but, you know, just from Amanda's anti-racism stuff and all the other kind of, we have a lot of good things going in the right direction here. And it's, that is, it gets out there. Parents talk. <clears throat> as you guys know, from your parents. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I'm hearing that, you all would like to move that retirement payout of $15,000 over to school choice. And assuming all pans out with this SR2 grant that we can cover 30,000 of early childhood, that would be the move that would get us closer to that two and a half percent. That's what feels most comfortable to a school committee. Yeah. Yeah. Shelly, what, what will we know about the lesser two? So there was a webinar on it this past week, and then the state is slowly, you know, getting more information out. And then I also need to talk to Brian about whether or not they want to access that for their local contribution requirement. Um, the hope is that they say no, and that actually gives us more funds. Um, but I think either way, we're going to be fine. I, I do think we're going to be able to use that money. And well, I think I, we'll know for sure by the next meeting. Shelly, explain this to me, though. So let's say they want to access... I'm just going to throw out a number. They want to access ten thousand dollars of that lesser two money for their assessment from the town. So that's about one percent. So do we reduce it by one percent if they if they take it and they're going to use it to spend it on that? Then do we go? You understand what I'm saying? It's either they spend or we spend it. We're not that so big of a district that you understand what I'm saying. I'm, but what we would so my understanding of what we would have to do is we act, we wouldn't actually give them the money because the money does come to the school. This is a grant for the school. But what we would have to do is if it is ten thousand, offset our budget with that ten thousand dollars. But we're doing that. We are, but they could require us to do it up to a certain amount, which limits what we have left for flexible spending kind of things. So we would have to address that need first, see what we have left for money, and then go from there. And this particular budget and the way we're heading it, it doesn't sound like that should be would be happening, but we'll see. No. <clears throat> and wait, Waitley, it's it's based on 
if your town required contribution on the chapter 70 formula goes up and Waitley is one of our towns that that's happening to. That enrollment went up by a couple kids. They also consider the wealth factor, how they calculate that number. The town has to pay more according to the state. So, um, and it's written right on the chapter 70 sheet, which if the town's looking at, you know, it's not like we can hide that from them. <laughs> um, so well, I think it's good to just- Don't say a word. <laughs> can hide anything from them. I mean, hey, they gave I, us some of their, they gave some of their CARES Act money to us. I'm not sure, well, how much was that? Do you remember? Oh, I don't have that number off the top of my head, but- You don't have to look it up, I just- yeah. Um, but I do think it's, we've had a lot of good transparent conversations with Brian, especially this year. And you now last year, I think we were as well, but now that I'm really in the budgets in my second year season of this, um, there's been a lot more communication and a lot more transparency. So it'll be good just to have that conversation with him and help guide the next steps that I take to bring you what we're looking at really as hopefully our final budget in March. And so I guess what we do need to co coordinate to jump right in there is that we did meet with the town administrators or Shelly and I did earlier this week to talk about timelines on budget because it's an odd year. And right now, Wheatley's town meeting is June 15th, I believe. It was, I think if it's not formally, that's what they have drafted. Is that draft right now or they voted it? Either way, it looks like it's going to be on the 15th in the evening. So that's June. So that we have a little bit more time. I think they're going to look at it the same way. So we'll have to find out when they want us to come visit. And I guess my question is this to this committee, do you want another budget meeting prior to the visit or do you feel with the alterations we talked about this evening that it's kind of at a spot where, you know, if there's not, it's, it's pretty straightforward, you know, but the budget's not very, this particular budget's not very complex in the amount of moving parts to it. Um, it's, it's ready for a discussion with the next group. And then, you know, we have to do a public hearing and all the other good stuff in mind as well. So. Um, because we have more time, it actually, we have to be careful not to be like, oh, and then also I'm like, oh my God, we have a deadline. Um, so I always have to be careful. So what are your thoughts on that, on this particular budget? I think we should, my personal opinion, I think we should put it forward to the, to the town if that's what you're asking. I mean. So I'm not saying forward to the town, you're not voting it forward to be going to the, to going to the, to the meeting. You're asking it to be forward. We're ready to have a conversation with the select board in the finance committee to discuss the budget, the, the, the 22 budget. But we usually send them something too, right? Yeah, the, we would send them that, we would, well, Shelly would send them the, the full on budget and then this is the explanation. We've been running yeah. off the explanation sheet. Remember, you have that full budget with all the X's and O's or ones and twos. <clears throat> yeah, sounds like we could go, go to that step. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I will start conversations on it, and I'll let you guys know. Thank you. Let's make you do this. All right. So, are we ready to move on to new business? The NASDAQ enrollment projections. Yeah. So this will be really quick. So I gave those to you. Um, they're not worth the paper they're printed on. As Chrissy pointed out to me, if you look at the projected numbers, they're crazy. And so I brought this up to Sundell and I go, yet again, these numbers are not reflective of the Frontiers numbers. I'm like, we're not going up that much in two years. No way. Um, and I mean, I can see the enrollments coming in. So I know we can't be going up that year unless, you know, the Brady Bunch times 12s moves in. So, um, you know, so... I, I am actually looking at the cost of NESDIC, which is around two grand a year for some of the other services that we don't really partake in, which is advertising and or you know administrative positions usually and that kind of stuff. And thinking about leaving NESDIC, um, their membership isn't giving us anything. And again, I've never said, hey, let's get the NESDIC report out to see what kindergarten is going to look like. You know, we call town hall. You know, it's like it's a little bit, we're a little more intimate. And I mean, it gives us interesting trends in New England but we don't need to be paying for a report for that. So yeah, we'll I didn't realize that we were paying for this. Oh, so, we're, so it's over the all five. So you're paying a much smaller mm -hmm. portion of that. And it comes out of like dues out of central office. So um, I'm sure there's other things we can be using that money toward. I agree. You'll be happy to note that the projections have us at 237 students by the year 2027. 
So we're going to have to like think about building a second floor just to put that in the back of your, back of your mind. Well, they're not coming from the Halla family, so. <laughs> yeah, you got to move your twins back here. Yeah, maybe that, that could be, that could be. Okay. Um, I don't have a report as the chair and the collaborative, there wasn't, I know much to say about that. Um, they closed their um, posting for the executive director position. And as of the end of January, sometime they had about 89 applicants from around here and around the country. And they're working on their strate strategic planning. And um, that's all I have for that. Um, Chrissy, principal's report. Okay, so update on phase three. Um, and Maureen and Beth, this is, this is gonna be old news for you because you've been living it with me. Um, as of January 18th, all hybrid students attending are attending in-person learning for four days a week. Um, we have made adjustments to some of our procedures like arrival, dismissal, um, <laughs> Test staff change the way we do things. Lunch, recess, staff duties. Um, this is our, this is the third week of having all the hybrid students at school together, and we're settling in really nicely to phase three. Um, despite all my my worries about being able to maintain the level of uh, safety that we had when we were only half of us in the building, so um, it, it feels it feels pretty good. Uh, the students have adjusted and seem quite happy with the increased time in person. Students who are fully remote receive instruction from a combination of the classroom teacher, instructional assistant, specialists, and the principal. Shout out to fourth grade science students who are remote. Um, instructions being planned in a way that the remote students and hybrid students are covering the same content each week. Our numbers right now, we have 96 students who are hybrid from pre-K to six, and we have 19 students who are fully remote something about pool testing, but we don't need to talk about that. Um, our Chromebooks at long last have arrived. Woohoo! <laughs> um, so we are in the process of preparing them for use. We'll be collecting any Chromebook that was borrowed by a student in kindergarten, first and second grade, because the new Chromebooks have been purchased specifically for those students. Traditionally, our younger students have worked with iPads because they're a little bit young child friendly, uh, more so than a Chromebook. Um, but when we shifted into remote learning, the iPads were not doing what they needed to do um, for remote learning. And who would have ever thought we'd have to think about something like that for kindergarten, first and second grade. So the new Chromebooks were ordered with the touchscreen feature. because That's the part that makes it a little more young child friendly um, while still being capable of of using all the software that we have to execute for remote learning. Once the K-2 Chromebooks are returned, we'll be able to redistribute those to grades three through six, and we should be at one-to-one -one at that point, which is great news. Uh, maintaining a safe and joyful learning environment. As you know, we don't allow visitors in the building, which is, you know, it builds sort of a wall between what we're doing here and and the, the families, and I don't especially love that. But, so families haven't had a chance to see what all of these safety procedures look like in action. Um, so five months into in-person learning, our students have adapted really well to social distancing, mask wearing, and general changes to the way we've traditionally done things. They have opportunities to play and socialize safely, which is more important than ever. Although there are restrictions on what the students play with and how they play, they've gotten clever at creating games that work within the restrictions. Winter has created some challenges for us. Lunch and snack have to happen in the classroom now, and most instruction takes place in the classroom rather than outside as it did in the fall. However, our recent storm, snowstorms have provided endless possibilities for safe play. So I say for the first time in my life, bring on the snow. It's been amazing to watch the kids out there playing. Even the you know, the older kids who are very cool um, have enjoyed building snowmen, snow forts, a snow caterpillar from the sixth grade. Um, so the part that's been most difficult for us is 
that students can't work closely together, like physically close together. And that's been a, that's been a big challenge. Under normal circumstances, so much of what we do involves collaboration. We've adjusted to this, but we really are looking forward to the day when we can work side by side again. Um, and so bear with me, I've got some, some thanks to give. Um, I feel a little bit like I'm at the, the Oscars and the music's gonna start playing and I'm gonna be taking off with the hook. But when I you, hear, want me, you want me to play some music in the background? Alexa, play uh, Who Let the Dogs Out? <laughs> when I hear about how things are going in other districts, I'm reminded of how lucky I am to be at a school and in a district that has risen to the incredible challenges that have come with in-person learning in the midst of a pandemic. The town and district... <laughs> <laughs> I like this stop. Uh, Sorry. Thanks, Bob. Um, the town and district administration have worked hard to ensure that we have all the resources and support we need. The families have remained patient and flexible in the face of one change after another. Many families have gone above and beyond to keep the school community safe, often inconveniencing themselves by keeping their child home when there's even a hint of a concern. And I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate that. People have been very, very cautious, and it is, it's so considerate of the rest of us that people are willing to do that. I can't say enough about how the staff has come together to keep us moving forward. It would be impossible to adequately describe how this has impacted what is asked of each and every person who works here. It's difficult, exhausting, and stressful, but you'd never know that by observing interactions between staff members and students. Finally, our amazing and resilient students are a constant reminder that all that we have to do to make school work this year is worth it. Without the daily infusion of happiness and joy that the students bring with them, we're not able to sustain these efforts. So thank you to the entire community because, it, you know, it always takes a village, but this year it certainly takes a village to keep us moving forward. So thank you to everybody, and certainly the school committee. Um, Chrissy, how is it going? Um, and there was one grade that there was an unexpected um, staff member that was taking a leave of absence, and um, I was wondering, you're muted. <laughs> that happens at least once in every meeting, so I'm happy to be able to to do that for you. Um, we have one staff member who's currently going between two classes, but I'm hoping that over the February break, I will be able to um, find someone who can sub for a little while. When you say a little while, is that to the end of the year? I think so. I don't know if that if a, an end date was put on it, but it's going to be for a while. And can you just, um, Wednesdays, the plan was to be remote for the rest of the school year, right? That was my, if my memory is correct. I, I believe so. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. Um, and in terms of one of the things that makes this work, and I, I know it's hard for families to kind of imagine what, what goes on, but um, because of the way things are, the teachers have significantly less time for um, meeting. They don't, their times don't match up anymore. I don't have, I've got two grades having lunch at a, at a time where I used to have half the school at one lunch and half at the other. So teachers use that time to kind of get together and collaborate. None of that is able to happen during the week anymore. So Wednesday is the day really for that teamwork. And especially in the situations where I've got um, the, the teacher and the IA who need to work together to figure out you know, the, the remote learning plan for the kids who are home full time. There's just a lot of stuff that needs to get done on Wednesdays in addition to ongoing professional development. Um, so I, I don't, I hope that no one has the impression that Wednesdays are just sort of a, you know, a, a fun day off for anybody. There's, there's a lot of stuff that just can't get done on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. So for now, I, I at least I feel that they're pretty necessary. And um, Darius was, was the, um, in the last meeting you talked about MCAS, they were gonna do some kind of MCAS this spring. That's still happening, because I know there was different groups and different people that didn't want to do it. Not not here, but in general, they were talking about- Yeah, there's there are groups out there trying to get petitions passed to stop it. I Again, I I, I don't agree with their, their statements. I mean, nobody likes standardized testing, but I also there's a value to it. Um, I mean, I think we need to do get a snapshot of how this year went. 
I know some of the other arguments that teachers are assessing all the time, but are we our assessments being compared across the state of how you know what we're doing here? And so um, that's how I feel. But right now we're moving forward on that. And if we want to have a discussion on that, I can put on the next agenda. Um, I do have to mention I have a 530 frontier budget subcommittee. So okay. Sorry, don't mean to whatever. did you have anything else? Um, I don't have anything else on my okay. <clears throat> okay. Then, um, and we don't have executive session today. Nope. All right, then, um, does anyone? Uh, second. Okay, all in favor? Yes. Yes. And yes, the meeting's adjourned at 525. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>